it's <laughs> Jack Grapes with the Book Fest Fall 2023. I love it. I love it. We, we've got a theme and a, a, an ambiance going on here with Jack. Now, Jack Graves is a legend. He is obviously a writer, an author, a poet, a playwright, a teacher. And Jack, I got to share how I met you because I tend to fall asleep watching, listening to YouTube videos on writing. And about two o'clock in the morning, one morning, I wake up to your voice and you are talking about the deep voice. So here I am about ready to turn off the TV because I just woke up and I suddenly am riveted by you talking about deep voice. You were doing film courage, I believe. And right. I was hooked. That's how I met you. After that, I got to give props to Flo Selfman and the Independent Writers of Southern California because Flo, about a month after that, is like, Jack Grapes is incredible. You have to invite him to the book fest because I believe you and I, maybe your son, too, spoke and taught yeah. at some IWAS events as well. So right. I just want to say thank you for that and welcome to the book fest. Well, it's good to be here, and I appreciate uh, the story. I'm just curious. You know, the deep voice is not like something I invented. I mean, it's it's a common thing, I think, in all writing, teaching. Why? What, what was it that hooked you on hearing someone talk about the deep voice? I mean, you know, I'm just it, curious. It switch on the, the interviewer, and she was doing an off-camera interview. So you could not see her, and I think that theater of the mind made it more compelling. Because you started asking her questions about herself to show her right. what you meant by deep voice. And the next thing I know, and it, it was a, the perfect example of deep voice because you were finding her deep voice. And out of this right. sleeping stupor, you pulled me in. Whereas I don't think any other you know, writing video at that moment would have had that effect. And I think that's the perfect example of what is meant by deep voice. And I think you nailed it. Well, you know, it's interesting because I have a technique for to help the writer get to a deeper voice. And there are levels of depth, of course. And I use the thing called the transformation line, which is a statement that has an I in it. But I also have the concept of the birthday cake. So the birthday cake is that part of the sentence that's irrelevant. And the example I use is something I had written at one point about a surprise party for my brother. And I said, my brother walked in when I was hiding the birthday cake. Well, if you get rid of the birthday cake, which happens to be the words, the birthday cake, I'm left with I was hiding. <clears throat> now, if I write about hiding a birthday cake, then I'm not going to get to a deep voice. But by getting rid of the the phrase, the birthday cake. So I'm just left with, I was hiding. And then I think of it in my mind, this is the answer to the question. What is the story of my life and the truth of who I am? I was hiding. So now if I start to go into that, I call it massaging it. You know, you're, you're digging your way through it. The story of my life and the truth of who I am is I was hiding. I, I, I didn't want, people to see me. I was afraid they wouldn't like me. I, I felt I felt like I was not not a good person. And they would see that. Or worse, they would see deep inside of me that I was a bad boy. And when I wrote I was a bad boy, suddenly I I, I like I lost my breath and I realized I'm going all the way back to when my mother would you know, maybe put me in the closet for being a bad boy and I couldn't come out. So all of a sudden I'm writing about this memory. I'm not only writing about it in the deep voice, but the memory is not something I thought about ahead of time. I was writing a story about a, a surprise party for my brother. So that's a technique. And I, in my book, Method Writing, I ship, you know, show the writer how to massage the transformation line using that structure. But when she the interviewer asked me to do it with her i went well i don't it's not something it's not like therapy i'm not here you know you're not in a room with me doing therapy it's what you would write but she said well just do it anyway so 
I did it with her, coaxing her like she would massage. I'd go deeper, deeper, deeper. But it really was meant for her to do herself in writing. So I got a lot of response on that from people thinking that I had really, you know, kind of opened her up. But it was like a I shouldn't have done that or I exposed her or something. And it was hard for me to explain. But that's not what I do. I'm not a therapist. This is for the writer to do. It's a technique to get them to the deep voice. And then once they're there and they massage it, things will come in their writing that they may not have thought to write about when they first started writing. And my interest is always about the creative process. And everybody's taught in school to outline your story and brainstorm and have ideas. And I don't believe in that. I, I In Second City, you know, you, you, you do improvisation. So I feel writing is like improvisation and the idea is to get to the deep truth. And so I came up with that technique, the transformation line. It's not therapy. It's writing. <laughs> exactly. It is not therapy. It's writing. Right. There's similar ways. It's, it's the elephant, right? Life is an elephant and writers are over there with the tail and the therapists have the trunk, but you're still playing with the same elephant. And I think that speaks to one of the cores of writers. A lot of well, times they're, they're on the surface. But let's flip it a minute and show how ridiculous it would be. Imagine if you were in a therapist, you know, in the room, in the, the room, and you told the therapist a story about how your mother had sometime locked you in a closet and you felt always locked in you and you felt that you were a bad boy and and that here you are as a human being with your therapist, you're an adult, you're an actualized adult, and yet deep inside you still feel like you're a bad boy. The therapist would never say to that, wow, that's good. Why don't you start with the part first about the party and then See, the therapist would never respond to that like it's a piece of art or literature. So I'm just saying, this is about writing. This is about the creative process. It's not about therapy. When you finish writing your piece, it may not help you therapeutically, but it might have an effect on your reader. So that, that's another switch. I'm not, you know, I'm not teaching people to write so that they get their therapy. It's to get the reader to experience something profound. And then the reader identifies and relates and goes, wow, this is a good story. I got to show it to my friend, you know, because it brings that out. So this is about making art. This is not about therapy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and good art does just that. It connects you. It connects you to somebody else, whether it's the reader, the person looking at the art, and it transcends space, time, everything. And it's that connectivity I think at the core that drives us to create art and to appreciate art in all its many different forms. And I think the voice, uh, you know, people always use the word voice when they talk about an artist coming into their own. And they don't necessarily mean it literally. You know, oh, a sculptor, she was in Paris and she found her voice uh, when, when after her third year there, or, oh, you know, he was a, a dancer, but a choreographer, but she found her voice uh, after five years of being in New York, you know, so we use the idea of finding your voice as a euphemism for your uniqueness, your, you're not imitating anyone anymore, you, you do in the beginning, you, you do imitate, but then at some point, you find your uniqueness. And so the term we use, you find your voice. In writing, it's literal. The words you put on that page, there is a voice there. And the reader feels that voice. The reader feels that you're talking to them intimately. They could be on a beach on some sunny California shore, and they open that book, and all of a sudden they're in a dank, dark prison cell wearing an iron mask. You know, the writer transports you, not just physically in space and time, but transports you emotionally. That voice on that page does the trick. How do you get that? That is my core of creativity, is to get that voice. Because once you hook the reader with that voice, then they care about the character. Even if it's a fictional character, they care about the character. 
Then when they care about the character, now they care about the story. But everybody starts with the story. No, start with the character. But before you get to the character, get to the voice, that narrative voice that says to the reader, I'm going to tell you something that I'm not telling anybody else. Even the other people in this book don't know it because you, dear reader, you're going to know everything. And you don't put the book down. That gives me shivers, Jack. That just really, uh, you're hitting it at the core. And you've mentioned your book, books, actually, Method Writing. Can you yep. talk about Method Writing? Yeah, I just happened to have a book here of Method Writing. And lo and behold, i got to get used to this screen. Lo and behold, it's got a picture of St. Augustine. Wait, there we go. And St. Augustine wrote his confessions. Interesting, confessions. And it's a great hallmark of philosophy and literature. And the confessional idea is something that works its way through all literature, whether it's Rousseau's confessions, Abelard's uh, History of My Calamities, or some of the modern poets of the 60s, like Sylvia Plath and, and Robert Lowell. And so um, method writing attempts to get to the core of what will bring you to your deep voice. And I use the techniques from Stanislavski's method acting because I'm an actor and a, and, and a, you know, I'm an actor and a playwright. But I'm not using acting techniques. I'm using techniques I've transformed into writing. So like the transformation line is one of those techniques that gets you to the deep voice. In acting, you try to get to the truth of the character you're playing. But it's the same idea. So that's what method writing is teaching, trying to teach people to do. People say you got to find your voice, but no one shows you how to do that. People tell you as an actor, be real on stage, but they're, they're, nobody tells you how to do that. They tell you how to act in a way that brings the truth of the script to, but there's no techniques for that until Stanislavski came along. And he created a whole series of techniques. You know, the ads are always... Sylvester Stallone is Rambo. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, what does that mean? You know, I, I'm supposed, I am Hannibal Lecter. I don't know how, how to do that. But through a series of techniques where you break down a script that's already written, the script is already written. You have to give it truth. In writing, the script isn't written. You have to begin with the truth and create the script. And the creation of the script, whether it's a poem, story, memoir, whatever, the creation of that script comes out of nothing. And yet it comes out of techniques that are inner techniques that you can use as a writer to open up the field of your work as a creative artist. So that's and what method writing is. Excellent. And people can find out more information about method writing, all your books. You have a speaker page on the BookFest website. And I'm going to tease this a little bit too, because you've been generous enough to offer a scholarship to one of your classes, because you do teach this, as you've mentioned, and you teach it online. I'm curious, Jack, as a teacher, somebody who has done this with so many students, what does that feel like to impart onto them the wisdom and watch them become writers and develop their deep voice, develop their writing. How does that feel for you? You sound like a therapist. <laughs> I always kid, I always kid with my wife. You know, I said that when she was practicing on me, when she was learning to become a therapist 30 years ago, you know, the first thing you do is how does that make you feel? And so she was practicing on me. So I had to say something, and then she would go, how does it make you feel? And I knew she was doing the technique and it still worked. I would say how well, blah, 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 blah. And then she'd go, and how did that make you feel? And then she'd go, the next, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, and then the other technique is I would say something and she would go, that must have been hard. <laughs> and I go, yeah, it was really hard, blah, 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 blah. So when you ask me how to make it feel, how does it make me feel? It's funny. I'm, I think of when my wife would practice on me. Uh, it feels good. It feels um, it feels important. 
it feels like that's one of my callings uh, that I experienced when I was about 12, 13 years old, which is the same age I experienced the calling to be a writer. It happened the same couple of years. Uh, a lot of turmoil in my household growing up. But when I would be in class and a student would ask the teacher a question that they didn't understand something, it could be math, it could be, you know, in English, could be history, whatever. And the teacher would give the answer. I would notice that the teacher didn't understand why the student didn't understand it. And I went, oh, the teacher has forgotten. The teacher knows the, the technical answer, but the teacher has forgotten what it's like to be 12 years old or 14 years old and how they don't understand it. But I understand it because I'm 12 or 14 and I didn't know it either two weeks ago. So then during recess, I would always get to the person and I'd go, well, you know, here's a simple way to work that out or this is what happened or whatever. And I would see them just light up and they got it. And no, I'm not casting asparagus on the teacher because the teacher was giving you a good answer, but she had forgotten that that question came from a place of not knowing that she had forgotten what it was like not to know that. But I, I knew it. I, I, I didn't know it two weeks ago. Well, I was the guy that all the kids in school would come to and say, Hi, could you explain to me about that multiplication table thing? I'm still not clear on it. I go, well, it's a symbol. Nine times six. What's the number right below six? Five. Okay. Five plus what equals nine? Four. Fifty-four. And they would go, oh, that's cool. So I got this feeling of of service, I guess is the right word, that I was, yeah, I'm not a nun going to some, you know, third world country, and but I'm serving people. I'm serving people. I'm giving them something. And I'm, I'm making them feel what I felt when I understood something. Because when I understood something, when I was in second grade, Miss Cook, the teacher, put me in a row that was at the very end of the classroom called the stupid row. And the A students were over here, then the B students, then the C, D, and then the F students. She called it that? Here. She called it that? Yeah, but it was, well, I don't know if she used the word just stupid row, but it was where all the kids who didn't, who made Fs. She and made so, it feel like the stupid row because she segregated you. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And All right. I, I, I just, I, I don't know if I said it to myself out loud, but if you ask me right now, why is it, Jack, that you will consume any kind of knowledge you can, knowledge about history, philosophy, uh, economics, uh, writing, creative, anything, every time I am, I mean, I, my house is filled with books. My, my, not just behind me. They're all, they're all around me. They're above me right here. Every house. My son would say, I grew up in a library disguised as a house. <laughs> when, when I read and I read incessantly, I'm always anything I could be, it doesn't matter. I could be out, whatever. I am giving the finger to Mrs. Cook. Stupid. I'll show you. And I, that has been I think my mission my whole life was to know as much as I could, but then there was the other side of that. What's the point of knowing all this stuff if you're not going to use it to better mankind? And my father, who was a, a, a socialist of, of a kind back in the Depression, he, you know, he read too, and he was a Marxist of kinds. What I got from him was that you know, we are we are equal. We're in a commune, and we're here to help each other. And so, if I have something, I should give it. I should give it. I should give it. And so, your question was, how does it make me feel? It makes me feel goddamn good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. 
And there's the middle finger too. What was her name? Mrs. Cook or whatever. Mrs. Cook. Mrs. Cook. So when I think of the great teachers in my life, beginning with my father, who was the wisest man I ever knew, but I've had teachers in my life who all taught me something very important, whether it was some spiritual idea or some knowledge idea or some tech, you know, I, I was an athlete. So I had coaches that taught me things. I, I was into magic tricks and I had a, when I was 12 years old, I'd get the streetcar downtown. I'd go up to his little apartment above his magic store before he opened it. And he would tutor me in doing magic tricks. I learned something from him that I have never forgotten. So I've learned from everybody, including Mrs. Cook, because by her putting me in the stupid row, it made me committed to something very, very deeply that I never let go of. And when I was doing magic tricks, there's two kinds of magic tricks. One has what's called a gimmick, like a hidden door or, you know, it's a little gimmick. Those are easy. The hard tricks are the ones that require prestidigitation, presto, fast, digit, fingers, shun the act of prestidigitation you have to be able to do things with your fingers and there was a trick where i would start out with one ball little red ball right here and then i'd go up in the air and then i would have two i should show it that way then i would go up in the air and i would have three my fingers aren't what they were when i was a kid and eventually i had one two three four balls all in my hand then i'd go up and there'd be three two and one and you, you would always show, nothing in my hand, go up, boop, boop, there's the ball. And I practiced it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks in front of a mirror. I got it down where I was doing it really well. And that day when I took the streetcar and I went up the stairs to his apartment and I showed him, I was so proud. And he said to me, you know, he, he said, very good. And then he said to me, now, one more thing you have to learn how to do. And eagerly, you know, I go, yeah, what? And he said, don't do the trick. Do the magic. I knew what he meant. What he meant was, is that in my mind, I was still doing the trick. I was doing the technique. And what he was saying was, you have to believe that there's a ball up there. And that when you have your hand and you go up, boom, there's the ball. And then you go up and now you got two and then you got three. Believe it in your mind. Don't do the trick. Do the magic. So it's one of the best lessons I ever got. So I have so many teachers. I had one teacher that had no understanding of grammar and punctuation and writing. But the teacher I had the year before. Man, she drilled it into me like I was a piece of clay. I mean, she would drag me up to the board by my ear and rub my nose in the chalk if I didn't get something. She taught me everything. That was fifth grade. No, eighth grade. Then I had a teacher in 10th grade who knew, not, knew none of that. But she said the magic words at the beginning of the semester. If you hand in a, a piece of creative writing, I'll give you an extra credit. Extra credit? I am writing furiously every day for extra credit. All she would do was check mark. And wait a minute, Mrs. Aim, she used to have red lines everywhere. This is wrong. This is wrong. Move this here. Move this there. Where were all the red marks? Huh? So then I write a few more things. Check mark, check mark, check mark. All right. She wants to play that way. Okay. Then I started writing things that didn't quite make sense. Check mark. Hmm. So then I started writing things that made linguistically no sense at all. I broke the syntax of the sentence. I did things that were logically incomprehensible. Check mark. Check mark. I didn't know anything about what we call experimental, postmodern, avant garde language poetry. But when I got to college and was opened up to 20th century poetry because I wanted to be a poet and write poetry. And they started lecturing on the language poets, the experimental poets, the postmodern poets, the avant-garde poets who didn't always make sense, who broke sentences and lines and it was all whatever. 
I went, well, I know about that. I knew that from eighth grade. I, I was doing doing that five years ago. I completely, so there were my, you know, the good teachers, my father, Mrs. Aim, certain, and my acting teachers. There was also Mrs. Cook and Mrs. Trocher. And they taught me in the opposite kind of way. But what does that tell you? Well, I'll tell you what it tells you. When I have students of mine who I love them dearly and I know they love me and they'll come back to me and say, um, you know, I took a class with so-and-so and I didn't learn anything from them. And they thought they were paying me a compliment. And I said to them, every teacher has something to teach you. It's your job to find out what they have to teach you. And if you come away saying to me they didn't teach you anything, it's your fault. So I turned their compliment on the head and said, it doesn't matter what the teacher is. Because I'm saying to them, go and study with other people. I'm, I'm not the only person in the world. Study with other people. Because everybody's going to teach you something. So I, I have kept an honored place in my heart for Mrs. Cook and Mrs. Trosha because they taught me something that I would have not have learned from the quote, good teacher. And it's been valuable. And of course we can't forget, don't do the trick. The trick is all that skillful stuff you learned as a writer by a lot of writing teachers who show you techniques, which I do too. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, don't just do the trick, do the magic. And what's the magic? The very first thing I teach. All my students who study with me for three years, five years, what's the most advanced thing I teach? The thing I taught you in the beginning class, massaging your transformation line and getting to the deep voice, because that, that's the magic, not the trick. You have written many books of poetry. And I, I think we could probably pay homage to those past teachers who maybe, you know, wasn't correcting your grammar, but letting you experiment so that you learn. Now, Jack, can we talk about your poetry as well? Because you are an amazing poet and artist. You have visual art as well and a playwright. But can you tell us about your poetry? Yeah. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I started writing novels because my father bought me a typewriter because he saw me writing by hand for a couple of years when I was 12. So eighth grade, you're 13, 14. He bought me a little portable, uh, a royal typewriter. And I started writing stories, typing them up with, I discovered carbon paper. Wow, you know, four sheets of carbon paper. You got four copies of your novel. That was really a lot of fun. And my goal was, I, I, I wrote a novel and it was 25 pages. You know, I'm, I'm 13, 14 years old. My goal was to write a novel that was more pages. That I wasn't thinking a better novel. You know, I was thinking, okay, can you do one that's 50 pages? Can you do one that's 75? So I, I wrote five or six novels in in eighth, ninth, tenth grade. I finally got to a 212-page novel called The Train of Fate. <laughs> I didn't even remember that. They're all upstairs in my attic, you know, in a in a big box. Um and at that point, I went, okay, I think, I think you've done it. I think, okay. And then I started writing less, fewer and fewer pages. And by the time I got to college, I wasn't writing short stories anymore even. I was writing poems. And so I got to where every poem I would write behind it had a novel. And the trick was... How do I get that novel into 20, 30, 40 lines? So that's when I became the poet and probably the poet because I realized um, the novel could be like a long term marriage, but a poem is like a one night stand, you know, <laughs> and, you know, that poem has got to just do the trick. And after that, that's it's done. So I think the the concentration of the poem is what. Uh, compelled me and, and what I've, I've been a poet all my life, even though I've written uh, prose, nonfiction, fiction, books on various things. At heart, I'm, I'm, I'm still a, I think I'm a poet. I think that's what I was all my, what I was in the beginning and what I will be at the end. I'll be a poet. 
You said something to the effect of one man's coda is another's prelude. Another man's prelude, yeah. Uh, well, uh, w w my last book, let's see if I can find it here. Here it is. My last book was actually, it's called Exit Music, and it's actually a compilation of not only many of my poems, but many of my, my paintings, like this one right here. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's on a napkin. And, yeah. and I started with two drops of ink on the napkin. And then I started filling around it. And then I don't know what made me write the caption, but the caption was, paint, paint happy, live sad, die perfect. <laughs> so that's one of my paintings. But most of my paintings were, were on, you know, canvas or, or um, and then I would put text in them. I don't know if you can see this, but there's a lot of text around yeah. that. Um, so I began to combine, like, like here's a simple one, um, you know, and this is not on a uh, canvas or art paper. This is on a paper towel. So you can actually, if you look up close, and you know, if you see it, you can see the lines of the paper towel. You may not be able to see it here. Yeah. But, uh, and then yeah. We are not alone. And uh, some of them are, are are rather simple, like this one, which became the cover of the book, but I changed the words. This one is just, no one drowns in the beautiful lake. I, I don't know what that means, but I know it means something. Um, let me see if I can find one more. Uh, uh, well, anyway, it's a book that combines uh, my own artwork uh, with poems. Uh, oh, here's a, here's one. This is on oil. It's a self-portrait. I have uh, quite a few self-portraits. So nice. that, there's that one. But then at the beginning of the book, there's uh, a self-portrait, which is titled Last Self-Portrait. I've been doing a whole bunch of portraits. Uh, I was taking uh, art classes from a woman named Susan Manders, who's a great art teacher. She was uh, did one of the angels for that year when they were doing the angels. She's really terrific. Um, and I collected some of her paintings. And um, I got tired of doing self-portraits. So we would have a mirror. So for the last one I did, I decided to do one where I put my hair in front of my face. And so my last self-portrait that I did, whoop, is that. That's called last yeah. self-portrait. And you can't see this, but the the shoot the hand there part. Yeah. The hand part has wait, the hand part only doesn't have anything filled in. You can see the canvas behind it. Uh-huh. So when you see the painting, one of the things about art is that the darker colors are in the distance. And the lighter colors are up close. So if I just had the outline of the hand covering my face, but I didn't fill in any of it, it really feels like it's you know close to the camera. So um, so this book uh, contains fifty new poems. So there's the poem, and then there's the painting here. Oh, shoot, I'm still not getting used to this reverse. There you go. There you go. But every yeah. painting has a little signage in red about art and it so there's a hundred of those that go through the book along with the hundred paintings but the signage doesn't go with each painting it's just a, a thing about art sometimes it's philosophical sometimes I have one when I said one day I was painting something and the art teacher came over to me and said why don't you paint a tree no she looked at it and said why don't you paint a tree and I said that is a tree. So that's the idea that, you know, obviously I thought it was a tree, but the art teacher didn't know what it was. But sometimes you have to, as an artist, whether you're a writer or a poet or a painter or an artist, whatever you're doing, you cannot depend on the teacher or another person to tell you what you should do, or even what you did. 
I know we want to write a book that sells a lot of copies. We want to make a lot of money. We want to retire to an island in the Pacific. We want the approbation of our parents, of our friends, and of the judges. You know, all the judges that are inside our heads that will say to you, oh, that's the tree. Good, you're painting a tree. Keep going, paint a tree. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to throw cold water on our desire to make a living from the art. But deep down inside, if you're going to do the magic, paint your tree and paint the tree that comes from your heart that you know is the tree. And it doesn't matter what anyone else sees there, whether they see a tree or the Empire State Building or the Brooklyn Bridge. You have got to follow your calling and you've got to follow your vision. And I know there can come a lot of sadness with that when you don't get the recognition you want. When people don't say, oh, that's not a tree, that's the Brooklyn Bridge. I, I know that that can be sad, but that's when you as an artist have to know that you're alone. And that's why that painting I did says we are not alone. You're not alone, but your company might be the company of all the great artists that ever lived. And you are part of that continuum. So you're not writing for your parents or your teachers or your friends or all the judges that are clouding in your mind. You're writing for the gods. A hundred years from now, 200 years from now, what is the offering? This makes me, makes me want to cry. You're offering the gods your tree. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how I got off in that. Oh. That was amazing. And that is so true. And I would like to know as a teacher that I'm giving people the tools and the validation. So the tools are one thing. The tools are one thing. The techniques are one thing. But the validation that they are on the right path. I, I You say, how does that make you feel? It, it, it makes me feel that I'm doing what I was called upon to do in this life. As well as paying the rent, raising a son, you know, maintaining a relationship and friends. I mean, you got to do all that. You know, you got to fly tire. You got to change the tire. You know, you can't go, oh, well, I'm going to write a poem. No, you got to change the tire. You got to pay your rent. I, I get that. I get all that. But do the magic. Paint a tree. Yes, do the magic. Paint a tree. And just to bring a little levity to this, because that's powerful stuff, Jack. That is so powerful. And your classes are amazing. They often book up far in advance. So yes, we'll be giving away a scholarship to one of those classes. Make sure that you enter to win that. That class is going to be the January 2024 class, I believe. Yeah, it'll start the week of January the 15th. I have classes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So pick a, you know, you can pick a class that fits your schedule. Or they're all the same. They just, I mean, each class would go, we're the best class. The Wednesday morning class is the best class, you know. But, you know, pick a class that would fit your thing. And I'm also in the grab bag offering, uh, I don't know how you're going to do this, but a 25% uh, discount on five to five people. So they can take any one of my classes and there's a discount. So, you know. Um. Exactly. You'll be in the virtual gift bag as well. Um, I got to say, you, you mentioned your house being a library. And I must admit, I have bookshelf envy right now. I just love the little bit that we can see behind you. Oh, this, like is you have... this is This is nothing. <laughs> and, you, and you know when it started? It started when I was 12 years old. I had accumulated a few books that I put on my desk, and then I I went to the hardware store and I made a shelf, 
And when I got that whole shelf filled, it was like, whoa, wow, <laughs> you know. And then I started adding shelves. So bookcases and books are my womb. You know, mm. the mm. the two places I go to be creative are my my study and there's other rooms in the house that have books, but this is my the books everywhere. I mean, let me see if my camera can pick that up. I don't know. I can see that. Yeah, and I love that. Oh, I love that. Right, and there's over there, and there's books up there. So I have a ladder where I can get to them. And what I can show you is the books that are right here. My camera won't reach all that spot. Yeah. But, but you know, I'm either going to be in my womb, or I love sitting in a in a cheap old coffee shop. You know, the old style coffee shop and writing in my journal. I just like that. All that noise and the clinking and everything. You know, some people say, "Oh, you know, it's I can't. I got to have a quiet place." I don't know. I like a noisy place. Mm -hmm. L.A. is a noisy place. You know, L.A. is mm -hmm. a noisy, noisy place. But you can find your womb in L.A. You know, you don't have to be in New York. You don't have to be in Chicago. You don't have to be in Paris. You can be in L.A., which I know is noted for its shallowness and its tinsel town and all of that stuff. But when you find your place, when you find your womb, that's where the magic happens. So don't think you have to be in a cafe in Paris or a coffee shop in New York. If you're here in L.A., find your womb. And if it's a coffee shop with a lot of noise, so be it. Yeah. Do your magic Go. in the womb. Go hang out at Cantor's with all of the yes. others. Two o'clock in the morning, boy. Cantor's. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I've I've always thought too, and I've told people that are not from LA, the beauty of LA is you can walk into a coffee shop or a party, an event. And you are surrounded by others that have been drawn to LA from all corners of usually the United States or the world that have that commonality. Yeah, it, it has turned shallow in many ways, but there's so much creative energy and you find others who are like you and share that. I think that's magical. Absolutely. And I never answered your question about one man's prelude is another man's coda, but exit music is the music you hear in a theater when the the movie is over and the credits have run and you're walking out and they play music in the theater and that's called exit music. And the theme of the book is me feeling like this is my exit music because I'm 80, I'll be 81 on 9-11. And, you know, when you're 80, 81, you're, you know, you, you got to be thinking about it. And so that was my exit music, this book of poems. So throughout the book, there are essays about musical you know, evolution and how it relates to the metaphor of your creation of art. So I have a whole thing on on the final movement and the cadenza and then coda. Coda is what you do right after that thing. you have a little coda. But Beethoven sometime would have a coda that he would then slice off and it would become the prelude of his next string quartet. So the end of my book, after the essay on the coda, and after the last poem of the book, and after the little bio, and after that painting I did of myself, and my list of books, you know, after the whole book is over, the next couple of pages is a story about how I realized I wanted to be a writer and an artist when I was six years old and peed in my pants. And I tell that story, and that's the prelude. So it's like the beginning of the next book I'm going to write, which if all goes well, I will write it. I love it. I love it. Reminds me of Led Zeppelin too. Led Zeppelin Coda. And you'd have that yeah. a lot of times in rock and roll where it would just roll right into the next one. Exactly. Jack, grapes. Thank you so much for being with us at the Book Festival 2023. Happy birthday. And Great. we have just a few seconds left. Parting thoughts. Anything else you'd like to share? Make your own kind of music. And a great, a great American philosopher, Martha Nussbaum, a woman philosopher who had to contend with a lot of men philosophers, 
I think she's still alive, but she's in her 70s. She said that at being a parent in terms of, you know, raising someone, there are three things that you, you want to give them. And if you give them that, if you model that and you give them that, everything else would be fine. And uh, the, the first thing was um, self-reflection, the ability to know something about yourself. Um, the second one, <laughs> I just blanked out on it. It's Martha Nussbaum, N-U-S-S-B-A-U-M. Self-reflection, then there's the second thing, and the third thing is love. Ah, excellent. We'll, we'll, we'll Google that. We'll put it in the comments. So that yeah, I'll, I'll cool. think of it after this is over. I'll go, oh, you left out the second one. <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Cook, you were right. <laughs> last shout out to Mrs. Cook. Thank you for making Jack Grapes into the man he is today and for him sharing with so many as a teacher, as a poet, as a writer, as a playwright. We didn't even really touch on your plays, but we're out of time, Jack. Maybe we'll have you come back for the next book fest, okay? Yeah, I would love it, and I sure appreciate it. You're inviting me and all your questions and everything else. And hats off to Dave and John, too. Absolutely. The team behind the scenes. Thank you, Jack Grapes, for being with us on the BookFest Fall 2023.